Hi, I'm Kaveh Rastigar, and you're watching for BassPlayersOnly.com. Hi, everyone. John Liebman here. You're watching for BassPlayersOnly.com. Coming to you today on location in Highland Park, Northeast Los Angeles, California, in the private studio of the one and only Kave Rastigar. How are you, Kave? Doing great, John. Thanks. Uh, thanks for having me. It's uh, it's an honor to be here with you. We did an interview, got to be uh, about a year or so ago, and I don't normally schedule a follow up that soon unless there's big time far out news happening in the interim, <laughs> which is your case. The first interview covered uh, your story. You were born, as I recall, in Montreal. Then you moved to Colorado and you went to school there. I think you also went to school at Eastman in Rochester, New York. That's right. And you've been here in L.A. for how long now? I moved to L.A. in uh, 1999. Oh, so you've been here a while. Yeah, yeah. I'm and, almost a native. <laughs> and you are uh, established in the music scene, to say the least. You've been with John Legend for several years. And I remember we talked about Sia and Kneebody. And uh, that interview is still up there for BassPlayersOnly.com. Just put in Kave Rastegar, K-A-V-E-H. R A S T E G A R. Wow. Okay. Congratulations. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. But uh, we, we might overlap some of the stuff we talked about. That's okay. But sure. bring us up to date on what's been keeping you busy with any or all of the uh, aforementioned names okay. or anything else. Okay. Um, well, I've been, I've been busy with uh, a good amount of uh, recording projects with uh, records that have just come out or records that are about to come out. And um, as you mentioned, I'm, I'm a member of a, of a jazz, with, it's a jazz quintet, but we definitely blur the lines of jazz and uh, a lot of genres of music. And uh, our band is called Knee Body. And we complete, we spent all of last year touring a record that we put out on uh, Brain Feeder, which is, uh, is, is a label that's uh, run by Flying Lotus, who's a great DJ producer. And we uh, did this record and we did the state, we toured the states, we toured, um, we got to Europe and we got to Brazil and we got to some festivals over the summer. And in during that time, we, and, and that was a record that was a collaboration with an electronic uh, producer beat maker um amazing artist named daedalus so we spent all of last year touring with daedalus and in the meantime we that i can't spell i think there's an a and an e and a there's an a and an e and there's a u it's kind of a vowel vowel centric uh appellation if you will um it's okay i can't spell appellation either <laughs> no i can <laughs> we uh uh in the in the meantime in the interim we um we 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 recorded a new knee body record, which will be coming out, uh, as far as I know, uh, it will be coming out in February of 2017. So we're really excited about that. Well, you should be. You know, you mentioned the word sessions, mm -hmm. and I want to ask you about that because I got the feeling that, you know, I, I know there are still sessions that are being done, but it's nothing like it was 10, 20, 30 years ago. You live in L.A., you're an established musician here in L.A., and I think a lot of people, including me, have the impression that most of the sessions or whatever's left of recording music that way, as far as the bass playing is concerned, is pretty much done by Leland Sklar, Abe Laboriel, Neil Steubenhaus, Bob Sklar, and, and a, a couple others. How much of a scene is there for, yeah, I don't know, Tim Landers? I, I, I can come up with a lot of names, but just give me some perspective on the session scene in LA from that perspective I mean I can only speak to it to to my experience and um, I never I I never got to experience the uh, the, the the heyday of um, of sessions there are some producers that I've worked with that were session players during the 70s and during during the 80s where it was it seemed to be there seemed to be a lot of activity um multiple records jingles movies that you would be doing on a daily weekly basis sometimes two or three projects in a day um and uh so i i i 
I, I hear the stories of that. I hear about the budgets that there used to be that there are no longer these days. But um, I think that um, I, I think that now, as far as my experience, things have transitioned into a world where uh, things are way more modular. You're, you're working with uh, a lot of private studios, um, home studios that um, there are, you know, there are just talking from a drummer's perspective, there are a lot of drummers that I know that are first call drummers, session drummers that are doing a, a big part, if not a majority of their work from their home studio and they're sending sessions to producers. If it's in, you know, in Nashville, New York, Atlanta, or, you know, here in LA. So is that good or bad? I mean, you know, I'm, I'm going to say that, um, it's it's got to be it's got to be a shock to the system of somebody who is used to that kind of world um and downsizing in any way is isn't good for somebody like us you know people like us that depend on the, that kind of work but i think the some of the good good sides of it are the connectivity that you can have with people all over the world so you know as you mentioned you mentioned those great names of you know session musicians and bass players and you know, men and women who, who do a lot of that work and continue to work like that. Um, my experience has been, um, there, it, 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 things come in ebbs and flows and my career has been a mix of live playing. It's been a mix of bass playing within a lot of different genres, uh, electric bass playing, double bass playing, that kind of a thing, as well as, uh, writing guitar playing and that kind of thing. And, uh, uh, over the years, I'm going to say you rhetorically, I mean, you develop relationships with producers, you develop relationships with composers, and that can also mirror um, the development of a musician with bands that they're in. So, you know, let's say you're in 10 different bands, you're going to work a lot. You're going to work a lot, but just because you're going to have rehearsals, you're going to have gigs, you're going to have tours, blah, blah, blah. And that translates into session work. You, Do you have different people that call you just for upright and people that call you for just electric do you feel typecast in some way or do you does, does everybody know that you do everything you play with the bow and you i don't, I don't see any fretlesses but i assume you, you dabble in that a little bit too maybe um do you sing i do sing actually i mean i sing um you play the tuba i always felt i felt je uh, jealous of a lot of the uh, the eastman bass players because a lot of those guys came from a from a tuba background i know charlie hayden came from a tuba background i think scott lafaro might have oh. do you play oh, keyboard so. bass i know i'm firing questions but just as they as they come to me i'm you know i'm a i'm a i'm a jack of many trades and maybe uh arguably no i, I don't know if i'm an, a master of any of them but it key bass is something my so my 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 rationale for better or for worse with the music biz has always just been um it's kind of been uh uh naive total ignorance naivete in the sense of uh uh of, of expectations and of um uh basically from 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 day one where i figured out how to play a song just using my ears and picking up an instrument and feeling that magic of like oh my god that's the thing i'm doing the thing that i hear on that recording i kind of you know for better for worse felt like i had made it <laughs> which has real that attitude has always served me in terms of um enthusiasm and in terms of 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 not having expectations of like oh my god i'm not working enough or oh my god how am i going to pay the bills which are really practical concerns and i recommend them yeah. <laughs> but um but in some ways i think those kind of thoughts at an early age can can uh kind of disable young musicians and and really foster a sense of second guessing so as far as you know key bass all that stuff i've kind of um i've dove into that kind of stuff uh just because it's fun it's fun to get to do and it's fun to you know I try to learn how to do and get better at and that's kind of always been my it must approach. have been more than just fun though you must have been in a situation where you thought you know there's a practical application oh, to this or you were asked to do it or you yeah. were required to do it yeah yeah I mean I guess that's just speaking to that sense of um, when you're when you're really focusing on an instrument especially when you're young and you're you know uh, most people tend to focus on one instrument you know some people I know are brilliant and 
are able to kind of take in everything and spend that time and kind of develop their, get their 10,000 hours, you know, that Malcolm Gladwell talks about, Malcolm Gladwell. you know, they get those on other instruments as well as the primary instrument. But, you know, I focused on the electric bass and then I kind of moved into double bass and I moved into that kind of stuff. Well, you started with electric and then added. Okay. I did. Exactly. Yeah. So my path was, uh, you know, I was self-taught. Um, I was self-taught until I had already been quote unquote playing professionally for a few years. And, uh, and then I started taking lessons and studying the double bass. And that was, I think the, the bottom line is what, what we've been talking about is that you, you have to adapt because it's not like it was 10, 20, 30 years ago. There's so many different dynamics right now, the long distance or over the internet thing and the keyboard bass and all the other things, you just have to adapt because that's the way it was then. And this is the way it is now. You know, the the touring thing doesn't seem to have uh, seemed to be hurting the music industry at all. There's still plenty of that. Uh, let let's touch on your gig with John Legend because I know you've been with him for a while, and I think it's a good opportunity to just uh, hear a little bit about him and about that gig. So give us a little brief overview of uh, of your experience with him. Well, um, I've been playing with John for um, not too long. It's been two, maybe two and a half years. Uh, that was an opportunity that came up through a, a great, great young guitar player who was uh, serving as his musical director for um, a tour. And John was on the uh, in the middle of his last record cycle, and they had uh, kind of a new project where he was out with a string quartet, and then one of his singles had gotten a lot more success, and they had to you know hustle and book more dates to you know, just kind of meet the demand for, 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 you know, what he was creating. And so they were like, Oh, we're out with the string quartet. We need to add bass and drums and we need to kind of, you know, turn this into more of a dynamic show than just a, you know, kind of intimate uh, setting. So I jumped in kind of as a ringer, as an, in an emergency situation of like, you know, can we do this? Can you, you know, and I didn't know, I, you know, I know this guitar player now really well. His name's Ryan Lehrman, really talented. He works with Michael Buble and other people, Ben Folds, and he's a great young musician. Um, but he knew me from, he knew that I did a lot of things. And I think he primarily knew me as the bass player for Knee Body, but he also knew I worked with artists in different arenas and kind of perhaps understood the aesthetic so for me, it was jumping in, mostly playing upright bass, double bass, but picking up the electric. And then beyond that tour, um, you know, I, I love what John does. I love, uh, I think, you know, I love, as probably most people listening to this, you know, I love the music of Marvin Gaye. I love the music of Donny Hathaway, Curtis Mayfield. Um, and I feel like John is definitely in the tradition, in the lineage of that world. And it's a real, um, it's a wonderful experience to get to play music with an artist that, that has that, has that presence, has that artistic ability, has that musical ability. And t as a bass player to try to fill in those shoes, acknowledging those greats that were in those bass chairs, but also to bring which I know John appreciates too, you know, bringing all of the influences that we all know and love, be them, be them influences from, from the Beatles, be them influences from, you know, Willie Weeks and James Jamerson or, 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 you know, J, JD, um, Dilla, hip hop producers, um, Pino Palladino, a lot of, you know, there's a lot, there's a lot that you can do within, that music and you know I've, I've been loving playing with him it's he's he's really fun to play with and his band is is fantastic so it's um it's uh it's, it's just a fun experience working with john and everybody let's talk briefly about your equipment i remember last time we were talking about ghs strings and you've been with them for i don't know how long but tell me why you use those strings there sure are a lot of strings out there why ghs i uh <laughs> I'm a I'm a creature of habit. I think the first set of strings I ever had were GHS, GHS strings, and um, you you know I found my my 
sense of identity of playing and and the fe- you know the feel of you know the way that I touch the bass and make make sounds uh, with those strings and I would try other strings by happenstance like strings would come my way and I would try different sets of strings and um, yeah anytime I would uh, would you know I'd have to go buy strings I would look for GHS you know medium medium gauge long scale bass boomers mm-hmm. that um, that you know I I know how to make sounds on and I love you know I love those strings and I really love the uh, the, the the organization there I love the you know the tight knit, knit community that there is you know made in the USA it's from made in Michigan exactly and my mother is from Detroit so I feel a little bit of affinity for um, you know I don't know I'm, I can't say enough good things about those strings I'm I'm, I'm psyched to play them well, great. How about, I think that people would be curious if you could just rattle off the basses, amps, and uh, any effects or preamps or anything else that you use. I think that people would be interested in hearing that. Okay. Um, I, I, have, uh, I have a couple of uh, P basses. Um, the P bass that you might have seen me play with typically uh, is a 1964 uh, Fender Precision bass that I found on, it's a green, I don't know what the color is, it's like a seafoam green or something that um, is really checked and and uh, I found it on tour. Uh, Nate Wood, the drummer of Kneebody, he and I were on tour with another artist maybe 12 years ago uh, driving through the Midwest and I had, I had seen this bass, I was looking for a P bass doing a radio tour and I got it at Willie's Guitars out there in St. Paul. And so I've got that. I've got a 75 uh, P bass, black P bass that I use. And I'm using, and I've, I've got flats, uh, flat wound strings on that. And then I've got other older vintage basses, um, uh, a couple of Gibson basses, an EB2 um, made in the 60s, and an EBO. <clears throat> got a Hoffner. It isn't an old Hoffner, it's one of the newer ones. I got a True Tone here in Santa Monica, that is great. It sounds great, it's super balanced and, and it's got that just that big, big sound. Um, I've got, uh, I played with Luciano Ligabue, who was a great Italian artist uh, for, for six years. So when I was there, I would go to a music store in Bologna called Scalopendra that they have, it's like a kid in a candy store, kind of vintage place where they have all these vintage American instruments, British instruments, but they also have all these vintage Italian instruments. So I got an old echo bass. Um, Did they have any uprights in there? Uh, they didn't, but they had they had all of this, uh, you know, just like rock and roll gear, like uh, you know, things that you you can't really find. It's really combed over and <clears throat> a really nice curated shop. Um, yeah, I was just in Italy uh, earlier this year, and wh- wherever possible, I'd, I'd go into a music store and check. I, oh, what a, you can't get a more rich musical heritage than Italy. I don't remember if I asked you this last time, but the last question, what would you be if you weren't a bass player? Something outside of music. Um, one of the funnest, the, the, the most fun I had working a job was uh, from the time I was 18, 18 for about two years, uh, I was a bike messenger <laughs> in Denver, Colorado. I was, a, you know, you get on all those bike. mountains and hills. <laughs> yeah, there, well, there, there are no mountains in Denver, but yeah, you're at a high elevation. So you're, so you're, uh, your lungs are really working over time, but it was, it was, <clears throat> it was the most fun ever, you know, just to be sprinting through the city you know, bull, you know, passing cars, <laughs> running through lights, uh, running up elevators. I right. can only imagine the uh, type of parcels that one would be delivering these days in Colorado in that kind of job. But <laughs> we'll leave that to the imagination. <laughs> Kave Rastigar, great catching up with you. Good luck with John Legend and Kneebody and Sia if you're still doing anything with her and the record and the tour and everything else. So uh, please keep us posted and uh, we'll have to do a follow-up interview and see what you're up to because I know there's going to be lots more to talk about real soon. From the fancy, really cool, happening, burning studio in, where are we? Highland Park, Northeast California. 
Northeast, yeah. Northeast LA, yes. <laughs> Somewhere in there I got it right. With Cave Rastigar, I am John Liebman. You're watching for BassPlayersOnly.com. <laughs> Thank you.